Our invocation this morning is from Isaiah 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Amen. I love those words from Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Our Lord is the everlasting God. We grow weary, don't we? But God does it. Welcome this morning. And on another beautiful fall day, and we had a beautiful day yesterday for the yard sale, and we are thankful to God for that. Thankful uh, to everyone who helped out with that, and everybody had their job, and it was just amazing uh, how it all worked together. And uh, I had some nice comments from people who came that said it was well organized, and we're glad that, that we had it. So uh, I know some kids really loved those crafts, and, and uh, I, I hope that people felt the love of God coming from us uh, for the community, for those who came. And so, thank you. Uh, yeah, now, welcome to those who are watching us online as well. Uh, it's a good day to come together and to worship God. We will have our children's Sunday school at 11 on Zoom, as we usually do, and our Zoom coffee hour at 11.30 today. We're also going to have our Zoom Bible study Tomorrow evening, we've gotten as far as the minor prophets, and we'll be talking about them, and, uh, and on next week to the New Testament. So we're moving fast, but there's a lot to learn. If you haven't come to the Bible study, you're welcome to join at any point and uh, find out uh, what's going on in that book we call the Bible. It's the Bible tour. It's, it's, a, it's a fast ride through all the books of the Bible. So uh, we welcome you to join for that. Um, our district superintendent's office has asked us to publicize that there are several positions, clerical positions available at the conference offices in Valley Forge, one full-time and two part-time. So if you know anyone who might be interested in that, uh, they've asked us to spread the word. So there it is. Okay, thank you. We're ready to continue our work. Please stand for the call to worship. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. The world, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it in the rivers. And who will stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts. We name the earth as belonging to God. People of faith, gather now to worship God, the creator and redeemer of the world. Gather now to be transformed by God's compassionate love. We praise the joy of the world's creator, God of justice, love, and peace. Now let's take a few moments to greet each other with signs of peace.
shall go out with joy. And then later on, the verse, the trees of the field will pluck their hands. So that's a joyful one. Uh, so let's hear this, the trees of the field. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedar with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea, it shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forage ravaged it, and insects from the fields fed on it. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised for yourself.
is showing now in the prayer for illumination. Let us pray. God is, O oh God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light you may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today is World Communion Sunday, and we remember all of those we are joined with in the spiritual family throughout the realm of believe in Jesus Christ. The scripture I'm about to read to you from Ephesians is the letter from Paul telling the members of the church of Ephesus what it means to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. Starting at verse 13, Ephesians 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace in his flesh. He has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near, for through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself, Jesus, Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Here ends the reading. So they had a major division in the church in Ephesus. When he, he's talking about the two groups, he's talking about the Gentiles and the Jews, which for them was a major division. And it was unthinkable in the world for people from those two groups to associate with each other. It was a long entrenched division. Our world is a world of division, is it not? You know what I mean? It's a world of divisions. And we have so many things that divide us. Globally, people talk about the East versus the West. The, the West is the European countries and us. And they talk about a north versus south division. The developed countries versus the less developed countries. The economic stresses that pit us against each other. The historic injustices that people are well aware of. And there are terrible divisions. There are divisions in our world also along religious lines. In almost every nation of the earth, people are divided in their religions. There are historic grievances and a lack of understanding and habits of prejudice and hatred that have been there for a long time. I knew a family, they were members of a church I served and they came from India and they were very faithful members, devout Christians. They told me that in some parts of India, if you are a Christian, you will be harassed and discriminated against. No one will give you a job. Your children will have trouble at school. And they have experienced this. Now, India is a modern country. It's a country like ours that has freedom of religion built into its laws. But the laws are one thing, and what happens is another thing, right? There's still uh, divisions, there are still stresses and 
discrimination, and even hatred. We have these divisions in our world and right in our own communities. They are close to us. Political divisions, ethnic divisions, religious divisions, and they get all tangled up together too. But today, we come to celebrate something that unites us with people all around the world. Today we come to celebrate that we have a spiritual bond with people everywhere who confess Jesus as their Savior. Today we will come to the table of grace where Christ presides. And usually when we come to take communion, we think about our relationship with God and what happens there. But the table is also about our relationship with the family of God, the people around us. That's what we believe. God has joined us together with them in a mystical, spiritual bond that cannot be broken by anything, even all the sin in the world. In the book of Ephesians, Paul explains that God has built us together into the church. The people are the building blocks of the church that God has built. Jesus is the cornerstone. As a tourist, I've been to some beautiful cathedrals. Have you ever seen a beautiful cathedral? A huge, awesome building usually. Uh, with just wonderful art and architecture. And they are built, presumably, to honor God. When you go into a cathedral, you're supposed to feel like you've left the earth behind, the everyday world, the, the contamination of everything that happens in the world. And you've stepped into God's space. You are in a little piece of God's heaven, God's presence on earth. You are supposed to feel the awe of that. You are supposed to find yourself immersed in beauty and truth. Everywhere around you, every square inch is crafted to remember God's truths and the stories of the Bible. And these places are awesome. Before a trip to Europe, I Years ago, I read a novel about what it took to build a cathedral. Maybe you've heard of it. It's Pillars of the Earth by Ben Follett. And it's, it's a wonderful story. And it dramatized what it took to get a cathedral built. Now, what a cathedral is, is it's a church that has a cathedra. A cathedra is the seat where the bishop sits. So it's the bishop's church. You have to have a bishop to have a cathedral. You can build a grand church building, uh, but if it doesn't have a cathedral, it's just a church. <laughs> you have to have a bishop to have a cathedral. And to get a cathedral built, it usually takes a bishop who wants to do it, you know, who wants to get that started. Back in medieval times, I'm talking about now. And, and so a bishop would get the idea that he wanted a grand cathedral in his town. And he would go about raising money for this. And the bishop would go around telling people, our town should have the grandest, the most beautiful cathedral of any, and this will impress our neighbors and, and, and show the world that we are important. And so you can see kind of the temptations of pride and the, that go on in that. And uh, the bishop raises the money from anyone who will give donations including poor and rich people. They, they uh, had the practice of selling what's called indulgences to poor people. So uh, first, to get poor people to give money, they don't, they don't have money, you know, they're poor. Um, but to get them to give money, you tell them they're going to suffer terribly in purgatory for their sins. But if they give this gift to the church, they can get some time off. And so they're basically frightened into buying these things. And they were pushed and pressed and, and pressured to buy these things, even though they may not have had enough money for food. And this is what outraged Protestants later. And, and they said, we're not going to do that. 
The bishops would also go to the rich people for large donations. And the rich people were told they could really impress God with a large gift. And they might be reminded of their sins. And yet, in some of the rich people they have some pretty bad sins. It's going to take a big gift to make that up to God. And so they would donate a lot. And the bishop would lean hard on them. Uh, they would, of course, also tell the rich people how impressed the world would be by their great cathedral. So that money is often raised on guilt and pride. Oftentimes, a bishop would, would undertake a huge project to build a cathedral, and they would run out of money or some catastrophe would happen, and it would sit half finished. That would never be completed. Sometimes they had problems with the design that the architecture science was just developing, and, and they might go to the cathedral and the ceiling might fall in, or some disaster, a wall might fall over because they uh, didn't really know how to do it exactly. But sometimes they would get their cathedral completed. And some of those are still here today for us to look at. And they are architectural marvels, amazing works of art. Later on, um, Protestants and others rejected the practice of raising money by preying on people's guilt. They pointed out that in the scriptures, forgiveness is free. Forgiveness doesn't cost money. Forgiveness is offered to us by God as a matter of grace. Jesus paid a heavy price for it in what he did for us. But it is offered to us without price. In a way, forgiveness does cost something. Because God asks us to have a contrite heart, a willingness to change, a willingness to repent of our sins in a sincere way, which means that we are willing to make changes in our lives. And for some people, that might be harder to do than just making a large donation. <laughs> if you want me to change myself, my life, that could be hard. And we also know that the church is not a building. That it's all about the people, and it always was for Jesus. After Peter confessed his faith to Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus said to him, On this rock I will build my church. And so Jesus uh, was telling Peter that he, the person, Peter, was a part of the foundation of the church. It wasn't about a building. It was always about the people. And Paul is saying in Ephesians, we are joined together like those stones in a building in the church that God has built. Paul tells the Ephesians that their divisions don't matter to God. It doesn't matter that some are Gentiles and some are Jews because through Christ, God is bringing them together. This was for those days a startling and radical thing to say. It means that all the things they were taught all their lives about that other group, how they were objectionable, how you wouldn't associate with them, how uh, maybe they were inferior, all their lives they were taught to be divided. And now Paul is telling them that doesn't matter anymore because God has joined us together. At the end of Ephesians 2, Paul says, so you are no longer strangers, but you are citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom, in, in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. God has joined us together. And all those other people who confess Jesus as their Savior are part of our spiritual family. I heard a story about a little Episcopal church uh, that had a problem 
and had a crisis around the year 1980. Some members of the church were angry, and they were saying that they were going to leave. And the reason they were angry was the denomination had come up with a new prayer book. They had updated the traditional prayer book, the Book of Common Prayer that they use in every worship service. And some people didn't like the new one, they liked the old one. And they were so upset they said they were going to leave. And that little church, which had been there for ages and ages, uh, didn't, they didn't know if they could survive if several families left the church and took their giving with them. And one of the members came to the priest and he said, I'm really upset about that new prayer book. He said, but I decided not to leave. And I decided not to leave because you don't leave family. Like he said, you don't leave family. And then he went a step further. He said, so I want you to tell me uh, for, about the people who leave, how much they pledge to give this year, and I'm going to make up the difference. <laughs> That's what he said. Because you don't leave family. I'm not sure where they would have gone if they left the church. There wasn't going to be another one using the old prayer books. So I don't know how that would work out for them. We are built together. And God has done this. God has joined us together to be a dwelling place for God. You know, just as the cathedral was supposed to be God's space in the world, God's presence in the world, Paul is saying, we are that. We are the place for God's presence in the world as the church. And our siblings, other believers, are all over the world, and we will remember them today at the table. Did you know that one of the places in the world where the number of Christians and congregations is growing rapidly is China? Chinese Christians are starting new congregations all the time. Oftentimes they meet in unofficial house churches. By one estimate, the number of Chinese Christians was about 3 million in the 1980s and could be 100 million today. That's a lot. But nobody knows how many because they are in a hostile environment. The government claims to allow freedom of worship, but has imposed restriction after restriction on the churches and the pastors, sometimes arresting pastors on trumped up charges, uh, even telling the pastors what topics they should preach on each week. A lot of Chinese Christians live in a kind of uh, underground or in the closet way because they want to avoid the harassment that they might experience. And people in their workplace or community know that they are worshiping Jesus Christ. Let us remember them when we come to the table today. I also heard a story about Chinese Christians uh, near the North Korean border uh, well, oftentimes, uh, North Koreans will escape across the border, and they're hungry. They don't have enough food. And when they get into China, and this is illegal, they're not supposed to be there, sometimes the Christians will give them food. But that is against the law. And yet they're doing it. Can you imagine the stress of that? How amazing are the members of our family, our Christian family, our brothers and sisters, around the world, in so many places, caring for people, feeding people, lifting up hope, working for change, working for justice. We have so many that we can be proud of, proud to be associated with them all over the world. And they deal with pressures we have never experienced. So as we come to the table today, let's be in prayer for them. Let us Remember them, they are our family. When we come to the table of grace and forgiveness, we celebrate that God has 
has joined us together. We are the places of the presence of God in the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. now to listen to the hymn One Bread, One Body and the words are celebrating just that thing that God has united us in spite of all the divisions of the world. that disease and now we have in the news that 
Um, those that have uh, been tested positive include President Trump and his wife, Melania, and others uh, who have worked in the White House. So we will include them in our prayers today. Uh, we also have prayed for the communities of color that are um, more affected by this disease. We have the, the African soul there just to remind us of, of those particular struggles that those communities have and the need for justice and peace in our world. So let's uh, keep everyone in prayer and pray that we can do what it takes to put this disease behind us, not only in this country, but in the world. Um, so let's come to God in prayer. Oh God, we are thankful today for another beautiful day. And we are thankful you gave us a beautiful day yesterday. For all those who came to this church property and found something they wanted, we give you thanks. I give you thanks for the diligent workers who did so much to prepare and to make everything safe and healthy. Oh God, we are thankful for your many daily blessings, the gifts of life and breath, family and people we love. And today especially we thank you for our spiritual family. For those believers we are joined together with those believers you have connected us with around the world who are so faithful, so brave, so diligent in their service to you, those who are caring for people, those who are working in their communities, those who are lifting up hope. We thank you for them. Remind us that we are not alone that we are part of your worldwide family. We pray for those who struggle, whose lives are not safe, who experience discrimination and harassment and pressures. Oh God, give them strength, hold them up. Remind us about them so that we can pray for them and support them. We thank you for that beautiful bond of love and spirit that you created in your family. Oh God, we thank you for answers to prayers. People we have prayed for have gotten well and are getting well. We thank you. Today we lift up Mary Ann and ask for your healing grace for her and Nancy. Pray for your strength every day for Nancy in her mind and spirit. For oh God, we know there are many who suffer with COVID-19 and how frightening that must be. We pray for them, for all who have become ill with this disease. And we pray for the, the people whose names we do not know and the people whose names we do know for the president and his wife, or others at, at high levels in the government, we ask that your spirit would work in them. Help us to work together for the benefit of all to defeat this disease and to promote health in our nation and in our world. Oh God, you are an amazing God. You have built us together into your church. It is the most beautiful cathedral. It is the most awesome. It is a work of art and beauty that you have made with Jesus as the cornerstone. It is amazing in our eyes. We thank you for these words today that we've heard from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, reminding us of who and whose we are. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, and we pray as he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. When we hear the word of God, it calls us to commitment. It calls us to service and to doing the things that God would have us do. We have heard today that we are joined together in a worldwide church. The commitment we make is to God and to each other. You, you have an offering envelope for World Communion Sunday today. I know we've had a lot of special offerings. This is the last one until Christmas. So uh, I would encourage you to put whatever amount in there. It could be just a few dollars. It makes a difference. And uh, this goes to ministries, uh, both in our conference and around the world, that promote understanding among different traditions. One of our divisions that we have in the world is denominational, right? And even within our own denomination, you know, somebody said, whenever the name of an organization has the word united in it, there's probably a division somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, and so we know what that is. Uh, but when we make a commitment to unity, we, we need to remember to pray for unity, to pray for our sisters and brothers around the world. And, and if we care, we will... We will make the commitment to find out what's going on, what's happening with them, what they need, uh, even give of our resources. Now, usually we give mostly to ministries in our community and in, in the area, uh, but remembering that we are connected with believers around the world should remind us that some of our giving should be for people in other places and other countries and other places in the world. So I encourage you uh, to make that commitment to God. I will remember that I am connected with all of these other beautiful people around the world. And this will affect my actions. And today, if you have an offering and your special offering for Queen Sunday, you can leave in the plate down in front as you leave. And those who are online, there's uh, a button on our church webpage for giving that you can take advantage of as well. Okay. Please stand now as we say the prayer of dedication. Let's pray. Oh God, may our offerings reach out to bring hope and grace to our near and distant neighbors whom you know and love. We pray in the most excellent name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. You may be seated. And I'd like you to take the insert in your bulletin for World Communion Sunday. And you know, we, we, most of the words are the same when we share at the table. Uh, but sometimes we have some extra special words for the occasion. And so this one is for World Communion Sunday. And in this time, uh, you'll take the uh, communion the cup that you have in your bag, and I'll tell you when to open the top and receive the, the bread in the form of the wafer, and then uh, to open the bottom part and, uh, and drink the cup there. And then your bag is so you can put your um, cup in there, and... Um, dispose of it later so nothing spills. So we have that ready for you. So let's turn to the words for World Communion Sunday. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere <coughs> to give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
You created for yourself a world filled with diversity and blessed by your breath of life. In mercy, while we still held to the chains of pride and self-righteousness, you loved us steadfastly and delivered us as babes to reflect the beauty and diversity of your grace and bring us into a community of love, hope, and peace. And so with all your people on earth, in every place where two or more are gathered in your name, and all the company of heaven who have gone before us, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He prayed that we might be one, as he is one with you. And he asked that we might be known by the love we have for one another. On the night which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, a union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we, together as a new creation and a new community around the globe, may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, help the body of Christ be one. Help the left hand and the right hand Work as one in ministry to all the world. Help the eyes and the ears sense your presence and coming kingdom. Bring the blessing of diversity of the body to bear fruit until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. So I will invite you now to take your cup and to open the cup. And take a little patience. And receive the body of Christ given for you. And now the blood of Christ given for you. Let's just close this with prayer. Oh God, we thank you for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go 
out into the world as one body in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we'll listen to one of my favorite hymns. In Christ, there is no east or west.